Our first case is Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. Regina, by the way, is Latin for the queen. Rex is the king. The two defendants, another man, and their victim were cast away in an open boat in the ocean, over a thousand miles from land. All except the victim were rescued after about three weeks at sea. It was a miracle that any of them survived. They had no fresh water other than what rainwater they could collect. The victim, Parker, was prostrate and helpless when the defendants cut his throat so they could drink his blood and eat his flesh. The four sailors had nothing to eat except two tins of turnips and a turtle. There had been nothing to eat at all for the four days preceding the killing of Parker. The defendants believed that they would all die unless some one of them was sacrificed to give the others a chance at being rescued. Parker was chosen because he was evidently at death's door already. Parker had been drinking seawater. This is a bad choice because it upsets the chemical balance in the body, which interferes with the transmission of signals along the nerves. Parker, being unconscious, did not participate in the discussions. A fourth crew member dissented from the plan, but feasted on Parker's flesh after the deed was done. Once back home, Dudley and Stevens made no secret of what had transpired. Their criminal prosecution came to them as a surprise. They had done the best they could to follow the so-called custom of the sea. In a dire situation of this sort, the custom called for a fair procedure to select those necessary to be sacrificed, assuming there are not enough volunteers. It would have been silly to have drawn straws in this situation. Parker would have been unable to partake of bits of Dudley had they been offered. The court dismisses the affirmative defense of necessity raised by the defendants. We will return to this and other affirmative defenses later in the semester. Right now, we want to focus on the elements of the criminal offense. Dudley and Stevens are charged with murder. The facts are tried to a jury, but it is unable to return a verdict. The jury foreman reports that the facts are not disputed, but whether upon the whole matter the killing be murder, the jurors are ignorant and pray the advice of the court. Parenthetically, we note that the procedure followed in this case is not usual. In the U.S., criminal juries typically are charged to return a general verdict of guilty or not guilty, and there is no recital of facts found by the jury, as in this case. Anyway, the facts are clear, but the jury doesn't know what to say about them. In particular, the jury can't make up its mind whether to call what happened murder or not. We need to pay close attention to what is going on here. Why is it so important whether what the defendants did is called murder or not? They either did something they should hang for, or they didn't. If they did something they should hang for, they should be hanged. No? The court says that what they did cannot be justified by appealing to its necessity. So what they did was something they should hang for. The jury finds they did something so wrong that the court is going to sentence them to hang for it, but the court can't sentence them to hang until the court finds the defendants guilty of the crime of murder. This is an ancient principle and the most fundamental principle of criminal law. Nulla poena sine crimen. In English, no punishment except for crime. Think of it this way. 
The court knows the facts. The court orders a disposition of the case. The defendants must hang. But the court cannot move directly from the facts to a disposition. The move from the proven facts to the disposition is mediated by a defined criminal offense. The court is powerless to do anything until this question is answered. Was it murder? Murder is the defined criminal offense with which the defendants are charged. The court cannot short-circuit this process by simply letting the defendants go or by ordering them to hang without having decided whether or not they have committed murder. No punishment without crime. The crime charged is murder. Well, is what they did murder or isn't it? The jury can't tell. But the court wants the jury to say. Why not let murder be whatever it is that the Crown decides to hang you for? That would be contrary to a companion principle. No punishment without crime, and nulla crimen sine lege, meaning no crime without law. Put the two together. No punishment without crime, no crime without law. And it follows inexorably that there can be no punishment without law. That is our subject, the law that defines criminal offenses.